Good evening. Yay. Thank you so much for coming out tonight on this really rainy, nasty night. Um, I'm Barbara Cole. I'm the curator of the outdoor art collection here at UBC. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, we would like to acknowledge that we are gathered here uh, on the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam people. Okay. In my face more, perhaps. Mouth closer. Okay. <clears throat> yep. Hello? Test? Test, test. Better? Everybody? Yeah? Good? Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to say a few words about public space, and then I'm going to turn it over to Scott, uh, who will introduce Esther Shell of Gertz. Um, so um, what I wanted to say was that I, I think that as we move through the city, we are acutely aware of the buildings, the architecture, but also I think of the spaces between them. And it's in those in-between spaces that... Uh, that I think they are very dear to us. They are close to our hearts and we value them because it's there in the in-between that we feel that we can act, that we can speak, and that we begin to make the connections between the things that we think we know and the yet unimagined. So these in-between between spaces, as you know, they are often contested spaces. They're spaces of resistance, spaces to show solidarity, respect, publicly grieve, perhaps, celebrate. They can also be intimate spaces, where as individuals, we make personal de decisions about how we might contribute to the collective, the crowd, our fellow citizens. And the space of the university includes all of this and more. It's a space dedicated to learning, fostering curiosity, research, exploration. And again, the spaces between these buildings of learning are the spaces that we imagine to be ours. These public spaces, they are political spaces. And when art shares these spaces, it offers new insights, challenges assumptions, and it provides us a place for discourse. It asserts the agency of the university as a place of experimentation and exchange. Public space is probably the most challenging arena that an artist can choose to work within. And Esther Schell of Gertz has been doing that for a while. Quite a while. Um, so we're absolutely thrilled to be presenting a work of hers on the campus. Um, and I think it's a, a real honor to have it in the space and the place that it's being positioned. Um, so with that, thank you, Esther. It's been wonderful working with you so far. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Scott to introduce Esther. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. I don't. Am I loud enough? No. No. How about now? Is that okay? Okay. I um, I want to introduce my dear friend Esther Shalev. I met Esther at some time in the 1980s in Berlin. And uh, we've known each other for a long time. I didn't get a chance to work with her until 2013 when she did a show at the Balkan Art Gallery, which many of you may have seen. Um, and many of you know Esther. Esther is, I would say, uh, a member of the artistic community of this part of the world because she has done many projects here. She knows many people here. She's got an extensive network of friends and colleagues and people she has ongoing conversations with in this region. So I would call, that, I would call Esther a, a BC artist. Um, um, I, want to I want, thought about how to characterize her work very, very succinctly. I'm not sure how to do that. Esther and I are contemporaries. And that means that we were both raised in uh, the shadow of the Second World War. I think people our age are affected by that. Uh, certainly Esther's family much more deeply affected by it than my family. But I think that that um, produced uh, a deep and abiding, uh, rigorous uh, attention to history and to uh, what's going on around us in terms of historical trends and movements, especially an alertness and ever a vigilance, let's call it a vigilance, to uh, 
those forces that didn't quite dissipate completely during the last war, but flare up now and then around us. Um, Esther's work has a lot to do with uh, history, research, um, and um, investigating how we can repair the world that we live in. I would say that would sum it up for me. As a result, uh, her projects, especially her public projects, and her projects for institutions so often involve uh, research exploration into the deepest natures of, the, of those places that she works in. Um, so um, I'm very glad that she's come to talk to us tonight, and I'm very glad that she's doing a project. I can just maybe introduce that project a bit by saying that, gosh, Esther, was it three years ago we started this conversation? Uh, I think so. Um, UBC has uh, established several years ago a matching fund for public art projects uh, from the income from its development activity, uh, which meant that if we were going to do a project, we had to find donors to do the other half of it. And the idea of those projects, um, the ideal idea of those projects, was that we would commission artists to work with academic units to produce something involving research that really couldn't happen anywhere else except at a university. In other words, public art at a university that could only happen at a university. So uh, when Esther started her project, I believe she was in conversation with the philosophy department, which would suit her work. But um, as we walked around the campus, um, she verged towards uh, the history of the forest here and she began to talk to the botanical garden and one thing led to another which led to her uh, really magnificent uh, project the shadow which is dialectical in a, one, in a wonderful way it's it's both monumental and practically invisible in other words it's it's huge but it has no dimensionality um, so it's 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 very present and I wouldn't say it's absent but it's uh, it contains these paradoxes and uh, it reminds us of something about the past of where we are. Um, as you may know, Esther is a widely celebrated artist. I will not list all her shows, but she has uh, permanent projects in public spaces in Hamburg, Israel, Stockholm, Juanus, Geneva, and Glasgow. And soon, perhaps by the end of the month, she will start installation on a permanent project at UBC. So please help me welcome Esther Shalev. Thank you very much for reminding me about the time. And uh, oh, that's it. Is it OK now? Uh, hello everybody and thank you for the introduction and uh, I'm very grateful and thank you for have the opportunity to do something like to make a work in public space and leave uh, uh, a contradiction uh, about what we think history is about and that history is not only about ourselves uh, it's always, I think, what artists do is a little bit try to enlarge the to enlarge the. Is it, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Because there was something. So, so louder. Yeah. So, can we, do you want me to do it louder? It's never loud enough for me right now, but uh, okay. So, is it okay now? Yeah, great. So, for me, the reality in of art in public space is inherently political. 
It is about reflecting on the collective and individual images of history. It proposes to examine what is new histories and what should be telescoped into it in order to broaden the field of expression. And uh, what I say through that is to work in public space is always to work with a lot of uh, rules and with a lot of people. And it's not in a gallery. And it's, I kind of like it a lot. It's never very easy. And uh, it uh, makes kind of a magic in, uh, into, it works magic into it. So I'll talk about several works that I did during during my, here they are. So I'll talk about the work that actually marked the most me and what it is, monuments. And just to start, what the, I grew up in Lithuania under the Russian occupation means monuments of communism and the way the monument are monumental larger than us. And then we went and immigrated to Israel where there is other monuments. And for me, monuments were always something from the past. And I wanted to somehow understand what can we do with monuments. And when the opportunity came, and it came when I met uh, my second husband, the German artist, Jochen Gertz, and uh, we decided to give a proposition uh, to a competition in Hamburg. And the city of Hamburg, in the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, uh, was, uh, uh, was having the neo-fascism starting without even knowing how to call it, because the term wasn't yet there. And uh, for me to do another monument was something very complicated. And we decided to do a monument that disappeared. I said, if all monument disappears, like a child, poof, then we can start talking again. So we decided to craft a monument that disappears. And we proposed and magically uh, got the commission. And just to say, uh, to, when you work as an artist, especially in this in this case, it was the city of Hamburg that wanted a monument against fascism and not a monument for. All monuments are for something and not against. So it was, in a way, easier to craft a new idea. So the idea was a column of 12 meters high, one meter by one meter, covered with lead, inviting the people, the passers-by, in seven languages, to sign their name against fascism in the soft material. And when saying that a monument cannot fight against fascism, it's us, ourselves, that have to do it. And so, in a way, it was also using what we call sacrifice. The act of sacrifice is an interesting act. And here you see the plate that is today there. It was inaugurated in 86. Uh, the people around it were alarmed at the opening in 86. We had 400 people screaming at us, saying, what do you mean it's not the jumping lion? There's no names of victims, and you want us to sign. Are we fascists? What's going on? And it was scary, but it was also very inspiring because suddenly people talked about something it usually was not talked about and it was somehow in a silent. And this meeting, this opening actually inspired my work and informed my work later on. So during eight years, it slowly was lowered into the ground. As you see, this was the beginning where people are signing their name and it's still very nice. And slowly there were, it became like a place where everything is talked about, be it love, be it against Nazi, for Nazis. It was anything. It became like a place for discussion. We insisted that the monument is 
placed in the middle of the city and not in the park where they wanted to put it, where they usually put. And we insisted, no, we want it there. And luckily for us, in 89, the wall in Berlin disappeared, and suddenly the disappearing became something positive or something that shows that the world can renew itself. And uh, as you see, it became denser and denser. And every time we wanted to come to lower, saying it's full now, we want to lower, they say, please do not come. Every time you come, we have a havoc. There is all this journalist and all the people and everybody discuss it. So it became a political uh, kind of work. And also, when you have something that slowly is lowered, you also see that the whole reality, like the the houses look bigger, larger, taller. So uh, there is a physical thing that happened. And you see that uh, it wasn't like the beautiful thing, but it was really something that was vibrant and inspiring. And, um, and when it disappeared in 93, so one of the last one was Nazis rouse. So that it became like a place where people start to discuss with each other. So this is how it is today. You see where we wanted it. Behind is the marketplace. In front is the bus station. Underneath is the metro. And this is the monument against fascism today. It's only the top that is uh, visible today. The whole column of 14, uh, 14 meters, because there's two meters, is in in the ground, you can see from the lower part here, when you go to the metro, you can see a little glimpse, more or less, you can see your memories if you have or read in one of the seven languages, it's German, Russian, uh, French, English, uh, Hebrew, Arabic, and Turkish. So this was inaugurated then. And I will talk another work that I did in public space that is in Dublin. I was invited in Dublin to North Inner City, if you know about the, uh, the area. The area is, avoid, people avoid the area, they never go there. Uh, there is 70% of the kids die from heroin. It's especially in the gentrification time of 2003, if you remember the boom, of, uh, uh, of the real estate uh, that was really uh, so dramatic that when they told me what I just told you, I said, please bring the police, the doctors, but I, what can I do as an artist in such a, a dire situation? And uh, I said, after walking around again, I said, okay, I had an idea, and the idea was, to photograph 20 facades of houses, because the houses were very interesting. There were a variety of different construction. Means that I have to ask 20 different people, can I photograph your home? And you can say no, and we have to discuss. Sometimes it was a big, large building. And then I would ask somebody, can I project on your home? And then I would ask the third person, can I put a large projector into your home? because the streets are narrow, so they are projected across the street. It means 60 people would be discussed. It took a year, slowly, to discuss. And when we projected, I said also I want to have 20 projections, not one projection, that usually in the art is, for one night or two nights. I want a month. And uh, it was a month, and I put a red filter for one week and a white filter in one week. And what I did, I actually took this house that I and I projected it a little bit further. So what happened, it was you in the dark you don't see your house, you see it somewhere else. It moved. And I created the labyrinth inviting a local historian to take people around that never went to really everybody avoided it to go there and he would tell them the story of those houses. So in this case, for instance, we had to talk with a whole lot of people. And uh, so 20 projections were there for a month, uh, creating this kind of labyrinth. And as I said, it will change. 
and it will appear in like in places that you would never see. And what was amazing that during this one month, when I was doing the project, running around with this big camera and photographing and talking with people, I had police stop me and say, you cannot do that. You know, this is a very dangerous place. You cannot, they would not even go out from the car. They were dealers all around, you never knew if the kids are dealers or users or just kids. It was always something happening, but during this whole year and after that, this whole month, nobody tagged, the tag was there. Nobody damaged anything. Uh, people just walked around and everything, as you see, this is gentrification of those areas. And this labyrinth was really uh, for them a celebration to see their houses as an image. I photographed the, um, those images, those projections, and in this case, for instance, when you project on this kind of surface, the image is very much distorted or informed by the materiality. I, w I really liked what happened to the images. And the museum director phoned me one day, he said, Esther, why didn't you put a white piece of cloth? You would have had your images completely perfect. I said, I didn't want it perfect. I wanted it to inform by this kind of transformation. Because the transformation is something that is important. So I did photographs of the projection. I showed it in several times. And then they opened a new gallery in Dublin good and they invited me to show the photographs how the facades of the people became a subject of an artwork in a museum and I showed it after in any occasion this is my retrospective in Lausanne and I showed it in different places where I would be so all these two works are participatory works, but each work that you put in public space actually become a participatory work. And uh, last year, I, we inaugurated this work that is a double clock that you saw before that I did in 2000 in, uh, as a part of an installation of the house for Walter Benjamin in Weimar. And it's about Weimar and Buchenwald, these two opposites that live together in a, maybe the image will go, uh, that exist together in, uh, in the same vicinity and how, uh, and when we, when the city of Geneva, uh, it will come maybe the image, maybe. Uh, the city of Geneva really liked this work because they wanted a clock that goes backwards. And they installed it in the city of Geneva, and I thought that's very courageous. And they installed it on a building that was uh, beforehand, it was the workers that were in the beginning of the century constructing the, the watches. And so before that, this was, it was many uh, uh, people that, uh, came and lived there. And when we went to install it, the city bought it and installed it and realized it there. And the people that lived there said, uh, we want to talk. What is it? We want to put our work. Why to put this work here? Who is the artist? Why is it going? And uh, we had a great meeting. And the curator told them that, well, she's a curator of art in public space and she invites people to do this kind of works. And uh, and it's not because of them, it's because of the history and the remembering of the people that were living here before them. And it was interesting to see, and then I gave a presentation, it was very interesting to see how most of the people were satisfied to really understand, because we don't know how the reality is constructed around us. Who actually decides where uh, this building is actually constructed and why this design is taken and not another one. So from this I'll go and talk about the work that 
we are working on here that is called the shadow. And as uh, Scott said, we came uh, to, I came here in 2013, and several times before that too. And, uh, and I was always taken by the placement, when you look at the map where it's placed, it's placed like uh, at the end uh, of, of the continent, you can say, almost. Uh, and when you walk around on the campus, you have this kind of feeling that you're walking on, on top of the world because there is nothing that obscures this part. Uh, you see, uh, it's so vast, it's so horizontal in a way. And I, I, uh, I was, uh, Scott gave me a walk through the campus. And this is so important if somebody gives you a walk uh, through a place because you tuck in, in a way through his memories and his uh, engagement uh, to this uh, um, university. And, uh, and it's, it was a pretty elevating kind of way to go through all uh, behind the building. I never went through those uh, ways. And it inspired me a lot because he talked about the history of also the art uh, society and community, how it's interwoven into the university and how the creative act in the, and artists in different buildings are working in the university. And then I was giving a year later, it was the dean that is the architect of landscaping. So I had a first kind of walks with the art and the creativity part, and then the landscape, like nature going into the, uh, into this place. And um, there was something so touching about it that it inspired me to go and research what was the ground, what was here before. And here, it's like more or less comes with the beginning of history of photography. So uh, I went to the archive and I looked in all the photographs of the grounds that were taken here uh, of uh, the campus. And, uh, and what I discovered that actually there was no act of real logging. So the trees actually were cut uh, by somebody we do not know. And what I discovered that was actually homeless Japanese people that got to the city by different <laughs> histories and they lived here and from time to time they would cut one of these giant trees and sell the wood. Uh, and I would say they would sell to build houses. So more or less, we live in trees. There is this feeling of, uh, of this materiality uh, that, uh, that you have, the trees are there, you can still see them. If you walk down the slopes into the beach, you can see some of the trees still holding there. But what you see is what the sea, what the trees look at. And what they look at, they look at sawdust, they look at big containers with wood, they look at, uh, at the transformation, like really the moment of transformation. And when I uh, went with Keith, that was uh, my uh, curator uh, before Barbara, and we were walking on the slopes trying to photograph those enormous giants. And they, what is amazing with tree is what still, after being an artist for so long and a human being, the magical thing, the main magical thing is we are different from each other. And we are a sum up of what is our personal history is. Uh, be it the parents, be it the, the and the trees are the same. That each of them is different from each other, and each of them is negotiation with the wind, with the water, with the different trees around them. And uh, I, I said, well, you know, and then walking one day, the idea came. You know, I always say to my students when I teach, I say to do art is to throw a stone and to run to catch it. I Means it's impossible, but you still do it. And when the idea of the shadow um, kind of materialized in, in me, it was pretty scary because, but it was also thrilling because it was something in it that I, while doing the monument against fascism, I really loved the idea that it is, it's, there is an acceleration, that you can feel it, 
You can hear it, you can understand even today. And it goes into the ground. We never consider ground as a space. It's scary, we die, we are buried. So ground for artists is usually not a ground, at, and not a space. So for me, it, and then today, when I go and meet my shadow again, it is about uh, the space like mosaic. I was always a little bit as an artist jealous about those cult cultures that do mosaic, that do carpets. Uh, all this imagery, all this, uh, this space that you, we usually, we're not even aware of what we're walking usually on. We are so uh, apart from who is doing uh, the material world around us. We don't build it anymore. And what is, and I dealt with it in other projects. And uh, when finally the space of this plaza was attributed to me, uh, and suggested by Dean, and it was amazing because this plaza is paved by one color pavers. Really like the other parts, and now I'm a specialist of the pavers of the university. If you want to know anything, you can ask me. Um, uh, they, they, and he said it was waiting for you, there's nothing there. But there is something there. There is the new building of the students' uh, union. If you walk into the nest and you see the amount of wood that is there, you should, it's a wonderful building and very surprising. It's like somebody said it's like, uh, it's like going into Centre Pompidou because it's such an innovative idea because it has this five or six stories uh, empty and there is a big nest from wood just hanging there. And, and the students can just sit all, on everywhere on the periphery around it and work. And you know, you have the feeling of elevation again. And, and it's fantastic. You have even a place on the nest that you can sit on. Again, about the, I don't know who chose this design, who made this design, but it's so amazing that whoever did was inspired by the same thing, this idea of walking on, on the craft, you know? And, um, so when you have this, all this material wood there, to have a tree, a shadow. A shadow is like a photograph, a photography. It's a pro-photography. It's something about old light that is still there creating the shadow. It is uh, something, it doesn't move, but it's here with its particularity. And what I did too and uh, is I let, because of this particular uh, place, uh, I let the shadow image uh, appear uh, through, the, uh, through the pavers. Means I could have cut the pavers in that say, you can follow my, my uh, image. Uh, but I decided to follow, and it created a pixelization. Well, it doesn't want to do that. It's not yet there, so I, I agree. Uh, and um, and I, so if t I was attributed a grass patch, it would be informed by the grass. Uh, and uh, help and. Uh, <laughs> means I would do different uh, colors of grasses and it would be all pixelized, it means dotted by the grass. If it would be a road, it would be done by the road material. Means like I decided that in this case, my participant is the material. It's the, my participant is the one, the, the guy that designed the papers. Uh, the guy that is doing the pavers, the guy that is laying the pavers. Uh, and we were so lucky because the whole plaza was done. Can you imagine what is underneath the plaza? There is all the water system, anything. Uh, so uh, it's, it was like, for me, a very happy uh, situation with uh, the nest. Uh, the students will be walking on it. And I told this uh, work to somebody and he, she said, 
I would like, it's great, I can sit on this branch. It means when you walk, when you are, thank you so much, when you are vertical and the image of the tree is horizontal, there is a slow unconscious situation because when we see, we see a lot of things, but we only look at one thing and the rest goes to our unconscious. The shadow is this unconscious that of these forgotten things, be it the trees or be it other things. It's all the things that we know by definition that maybe they are not part of this history and maybe we can telescope and change the time and include them. I Means for me, it's not the first project that I do uh, about uh, uh, about trees because they are a big part. There is many trees in many countries, in many places, uh, and uh, but they are so special. If you if you look at this image, those shadows of those trees will slowly move with the sun, while this shadow will always be there, not moving. In a way, it will probably change by this and that, be it by rain or by uh, people walking on it. And, um, but it, it's there for, uh, for us to interact with it in a different way. And uh, I think consciously and unconsciously, it's uh, a way uh, that I'm pretty happy with, uh, with where we are at now. Uh, with uh, with the work because it's uh, it doesn't have an object as as uh, Scott said it's such a big work and Ian said to me too when he wrote me the email saying that's so great big impact no object and uh, and it's true because when they ask you when you do work in public space what about the maintenance. Uh, no problem here, no object. So it cannot fall, it already. So it, there is uh, something that is satisfying in the time of change. And there is something that is kind of, it's almost, I did once a flip book that is stuck. Because we, we always think we know how things go. And when you have a little kind of thing that stops you, even unconsciously, uh, it might be a place to think about what was here before, how uh, how did it work to become what it is today. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, there's many more. 
uh, they, in, with three colors of, uh, of black. It will be three colors, black and black and gray. And they will create the, the image of the shadow. And the construction will be very gradually uh, moving through the plaza. And we'll try to do a uh, uh, photo lab and to try to uh, document the creation of it. But as we start now, they said it would be very rainy and foggy, but I like rain. So this was photographed last year. So, uh, so this is the plaza, and this is the place. And what else is very fortunate is there is this mound here. So a lot of students sit in the mountain. Every time I say I do a work in the in UBC, and people say, "Oh, I studied there. There's a mount there." And I know that when they did a new building, there was a question to take the mount flattening or not, and they kept the mount. So what else do you want? You have a sandwich here, and you can watch it and interact. <laughs> It's such a wonderfully bold idea. What was the point where you saw it as a possibility? What is the point? Uh, well, you know, it's kind of when, you, when I do uh, 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 work, it's like more or less, it's, uh, it takes the sum up of me, and it, and it just appeared one day. And uh, it took me a couple of months, actually, to go to Scott and say, I have an idea. Yeah, because you have to familiarize. When you're lucky, this happens like that. It's like all your research, all your walking, all your observation, uh, come up with something. But it's not only that. I have a place on Borders Island, and I come to the West Coast for so many years. And I see the drama of the forest, and I love to go to the forest, and see the drama of the forest, how they fall, how they, how they change how they have an amazing activity that we absolutely think, sometimes we clean it. Uh, but I love to look at it. I, I, I love their history of what's happening there. And every time I come, there's a new thing to see. And, and here, there was this kind of uh, uh, beautiful empty place too, but this was given to me after. But when I was walking, I was walking for where the flag is and the main mall, and there is a moment, you just walk there and you have the feeling you're going to kind of fly off, you know? There is this, this vastness of horizon, and, and this is a big thing, and when the shadow, and I knew they're going to install the two totem poles. One was already done. And uh, I was also kind of looking where they're going to be, and I was you know, I was walking around, and the the idea just came just there. I can tell you, it was on the main uh, mall. And today, what is fantastic, the, the point is, there is a flag there, and then the top pole on the other side. You have the feeling that this kind of main mall is kind of oscillates between these two uh, things, and 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 suddenly. You have the feeling of you want to belong to this place, you want, you want to do, to add something, because you know there will be thousands that I do not know, but you know that in the university there's thousands of young people that will create our future, that if you have an opportunity to interact a little bit with something that makes you think and something, makes you ask the question, what do you do here? I think this wedge is Esther, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying, and I'm wondering um, about climbing the tree without climbing the tree. Yeah. Yeah, well, that would be nice. Yeah. It was like to do the tree after looking at a lot of trees, a lot of photographs, a lot of projects about people doing trees. I created the tree in 3D program because to make a shadow, to create a shadow, 
you have to create a tree. Because in the 3D program, you can put the light, and you create the shadow, and you can create an image. So this tree I created, I wanted a weathered tree. I wanted a tree that interacted with the world, with the trees next to it. It is, so if you see there's branches that are broken, and there are branches that are cut. So this is how this image got its shadow. So yeah, I climbed it in a, in a way. But it's by itself. It's, it's that solo tree, which we have with Emily Carr here as well. That, 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 that notion of the solo tree or the tree that's left. Yes. It's very strong in our imagination here. And I went by chance, the other time I went in Vancouver, next to the uh, Vancouver Yacht Club, there is a little museum. Uh, how do you call it? Do you know of it? Yeah. And is there this woman that sits there in, with all the objects? And she said, What are you doing here where you are? I told her the story about the tree. She said, I have one for you. And she took me to a, a large photograph where she said, This is the tree, it was called the Princess Anne or something like that. It was the last tree that stayed from a big fire. And this tree <laughs> looked similar to this tree because I showed her. She said, Here it is. So. <laughs> They exist here. I, in a way, somehow connected with this last one. And when I was now in another country and I talked about this work, they said, yeah, we have this single one tree that stayed for, and this single trees, they are very strong. And I see them now all over Vancouver when I travel, you know. Uh, and I, uh, you see this single tree standing there. and. I have even one in Paris next to where I am, and this tree, just whenever you give him space, it just goes all over the place, you know? And when it's not, it's like that. So, yeah, it is the single tree, they, they still survive some. Without community. And Suzanne Smart, <laughs> she teaches here. She does all this work on trees and the communication. Yes, between yes, I, I, I met with her. You did, yeah. eh? Yeah, during the research time, that was pretty long. Uh, that I worked with the with the people of the botanical garden that uh, were very very supportive, and a lot of other researchers. And that was a very amazing. I I, I hope one day we'll be uh, something around that because it was it, there's a lot of knowledge around this here that can spread and would be nice. So that the implications of a single tree is also we're also wondering about who it's communicating with. Absolutely. And why it's there? Yeah, yes. it's always it's so mysterious. Yeah, and today we are also in a time. There's this tree, the, the the book, and on the island of Cortez, we have people that are specialists about how trees communicate and how trees live and how. And and we are in a time that suddenly trees and their history and their being and their whereabouts is something uh, or becomes uh, of knowledge. And before that, it was a material. And so I'm very lucky uh, just to come into this and to, so the work can be embraced on this level too, that it becomes more conscious. It, yes. Could you say a bit more about um, your choice to use that spur as opposed to one of the other large cupras like cedar this was uh, something that uh, I personally, yeah, there is others, but I like, what I like about it, that it's, uh, it's there all the time, you know, it doesn't change, doesn't shed leaves. Uh, it, it's a personal choice that, because uh, I also, I think, have one just in front of my house, on there, and I can see it, but he has two. <laughs> yeah, just a second. I'm just curious, um, the reconciliation pole is close to this location. I wondered if um, your choice of subject uh, was maybe subconsciously um, inspired to provoke a conversation about the, you know, what else is in that space uh, with the reconciliation pole being close by. Of course, maybe. 
Yeah, because I, what I always try to say, it's the layering of history. It's like the layering of history. We are part, and from time to time, we need kind of to telescope apart, just to say, you have to enlarge it, you have to include it, because we are so, it's so little space there. And so, it's, uh, of course, there is like this new histories uh, that you have to include, and uh, they were there all the time, but uh, were not considered. So it is a beautiful time where other voices, all my work deals with a lot with that. It's how can you include other voices that are always there but are not? And I think the history of art is about that. It's uh, if you see the artist and what they decide to paint at a certain time, and they decide to paint the, the, the shoes of a, of a peasant instead of the king, or things like that. That is choice. Are, were always important in uh, in the imagery. Yes. Another toy. Me? Yeah. Why do you choose three kind of not colors, different kind? Because it's a shadow. Oh. Um, Well, it, it works well, I, I think. I was going to say that it holds the sadness as well as the majesty, you know, in that, in, in that sense of, and, and I think with the, uh, what the woman at the back was saying about the, the, the totem pole of reconciliation, and, and before that, these trees used to live till hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. There are very few of them. Yeah. Very few. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, there's a huge movement to save the ancient forests, of which they're just being cut down like that. So it, it has so much, I just love what you've done, because it has so many uh, ways that you're thinking can go around who is this being, this yeah. shadow is there. It's like a memory of something that lived. It's, it's not only really a memory of the people who lived at the time that tree lived, but of all the trees that are gone, mm -hmm. and how we don't value age. We cut things down very fast, at 80 years old, when they're merely adolescent boys or girls, you know. We cut these trees down now at 80 years old. Where is there meant to live? To... But it's still a place when I say in Europe that here they cut only once and now they're considering cutting a second. They say, what do you mean? Yeah. You know, I have an exhibition in Finland. They don't understand it, but they cut it permanently all the time because, and when I say this is here, I can still see the trees that were there before because and I, when I photograph the stumps, I always photograph so you don't know it's a stump. I, I make a photo like this, so you think it's a big tree. Uh, because they are huge, they are, but you know, and, and you can imagine, you can somehow imagine the tower and how. But it's the spaces in between them that just show how big the country is. So, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you, you talked about the other shadows of the other trees moving across, and uh, you mentioned um, photography, the shadow is a sort of photograph. Um, I'm also thinking about um, the shadow on a sundial and time, um, and this shadow of a pre colonial tree is. Uh, Again, back to the photography, a snapshot in time that is unchanging. Yeah. Yeah, so once I was uh, doing a proposition for a monument uh, about the Armenian genocide, and I wanted to do a garden in black and white, because history we know in black and white. And I said, in the day it, the Turkish government would recognize the genocide, I will replant it in color. So black and white and color is, uh, as I love photography, 
then I work a lot of the, the history of it is uh, when they started to do colored cars, these were, you know, vice versa with color photography. So I still hear the black and white the single cake for what it is, and it looks like the pigments of black are more resistant than the blue one, we checked it. <laughs> <laughs> now you know everything. Yeah. I just think like, one of the reasons that public art is kind of accepted, and I think like Stan Douglas's um, mural at the Woodwards is like a shared experience that everyone mm -hmm. has seen, so we can all talk about yes. it, right? So one of the reasons that as a strategy that they would be accepted, that Stan talked about crimes of the father, or crimes, oh, crimes of the father, or crimes yeah. of the past. Yeah. But, and then this one is easily, or more easily, or strategy accepted, because it's also mm -hmm. the crime of the past. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if we were to talk about, you know, like, UBC, like, disparity of like what UBC says for sexual harassment, what happens on campus, to the disparity of what the RCMP say. And the RCMP numbers are a lot higher than the UBC numbers. Or if we were to talk about that, all through Europe, tuitions are going down, but at UBC, they're going up. So it's like, the Douglas fir is kind of like crimes of the father, so it's easier to be accepted. And when you were talking about like the sub hub and like the student union, it's still to be determined if the world can handle another few generations of UBC students, or is it that the world can't live without the next generation of UBC students? Any thoughts? Well, we don't know. This is the magic of our future. <laughs> that you know, if we don't know, but I think. Why, why do you doubt that? Um, I think, like, a few years ago, I would think, like, every two or three years, I would think, wow, things are getting a lot worse. But now I think, like, every six or seven months, I say to myself, wow, things are getting a lot worse. Well, we should do something. But the... Yeah, just like just to summarize, like you know, we are talking about crimes of the father. Um, people that are walking around UBC right now, just like in the more like even general sense, like with the arts, like you know, people in Vancouver, young people in Vancouver, they've been told, and no, pardon me, they completely accept in the last four or five years that they will never own a detached home in Vancouver. They completely accept that. They even accept that they will never actually own an apartment in Vancouver. They've completely accepted that. So, and that's kind of like, every, everyone's vying for like attention, vying for that little bit of space that is there. And I don't really know, under capitalism, under that extreme capitalism that we're facing right now, what kind of attention or space is really being occupied by the average young person walking around in UBC. They're, they know for a fact, I've talked to them, they know that every semester they're going further and further into debt and they don't know if there's a job there. And the only thing that they know for sure is precarious employment. You know, I was in the same situation as a student. I was a single mom. And I had to pay my tuition and was sure that I could never own him. I didn't even think about that. It was out of my range. I decided to become an artist in spite of that child childhood. And uh, I was really into what I wanted to do so much at that time. So when you talk about that, uh, I don't know, I, I really don't know. I think when I walk on in this ground of this university, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's fantastic to walk around here. So at least the time they are here, they can interact and try to find a way. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it, it just occurred to me again because of the university setting. I mean, there's so many resonances here. 
Another one that I thought of with this singular tree would be the echo of the tree of knowledge or the tree of life, taking a look at sort of a sacred or symbolic tree uh, that is an original tree uh, that goes back to the, the beginning of nature and the beginning of culture, and uh, which designates knowledge for one thing uh, and uh, the rest of knowledge, but also life, um, and which makes it, for me, all the more emblematic uh, at a university setting. Yeah, and sorry, just like coming back to what you're saying, I'm not sure I entirely, you know, got the whole grasp of it. So like, if I'm kind of off, I'm sorry. But I think like, I don't know, as a university student myself, and knowing, you know, like friends who are also in university, I think a lot of us do study stuff, and we're not sure what job we're gonna have at the end of it, and it is expensive, and you know, there are concerns and stresses that come with that. But I think there's also a certain value to the knowledge that we get through it, and to the, the growth and just the, the cultural awareness and the celebration of the beauty and history and, and just, yeah, just the knowledge that you gain through the whole process of it. And I think there's a lot of value in that too, even if it's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily obvious the prescribed job it's gonna lead to. I think there's a lot to be gained just from the skills you, in learning how to think more analytically and critically and, and kind of to have a greater appreciation for the complexity that's in the world and the complexity of certain issues out there and just and I think like artworks like this it just it's thought provoking and it, it helps us come back to that beauty and the richness in kind of all that's around us. So I don't know, I think there there's something there's a certain value to that too, even if not I, I agree. Um, but saddled with uh, student loan, and now we know that there's actually people in Canada that are dying that still have student loan, and people that are like you know in their 60s and they're paying off their student loan or they're paying off their student loan, and now they can work like on their wife's student loan. So no, I agree. Um, everyone should be lucky enough to figure out who they are at a university for sure. Yeah, I think it's also great. That they in Canada, they're dying with student loans. In Europe, they're not. But in Europe, you know, like they're dying about France, they don't have that much. <laughs> no. You know, it's different system. In, in France, you don't pay for your studies, but you have a different. You don't have a beautiful company. It's different. Different places, and I think what is nice today, you can really go other places. And it's a uh, pretty fabulous time, in spite of what's happened all over, because of the economy. It's actually hard to hear because the microphone. Sorry. Yeah, it's hard to hear. Oh, uh, sorry. Pardon me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming.